All right. Uh, good afternoon or good evening or good morning from where you're joining us. But um, I'm going to get started shortly and let's see if we're, we are recording. All right. OK, so on behalf of the uh, American Red Cross, I want to first thank everyone for taking time out of your Wednesday uh, to join us. My name is Natalie Landau. I am a third year law student uh, at American University Washington College of Law um, in Washington, DC. And I work with the International Humanitarian Law Team, IHL for short, here at uh, the American Red Cross National Headquarters. We have two stellar panelists with us today who I will introduce shortly. Before that, allow me to just get some some general housekeeping out of the way. First, a bit about us. The American Red Cross IHL Dissemination Program works to raise awareness about international humanitarian law, also known as the law of armed conflict. This work is done primarily through the efforts of volunteer instructors. If you're interested in learning more, please reach out to your local American Red Cross chapter. Second, please feel free to use the Q&A or chat function to send in any specific questions you may have during the discussion. We will be monitoring it uh, and if possible, we'll ask your questions throughout, but if not, we'll try to leave some time at the end. Today, we're going to embark on a truly fascinating journey through the history of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, commonly known as the ICTY. Established by the United Nations Security Council on May 25th, 1993, this unique body was created as a response to the conflicts in the former Yugoslavia with the goal of bringing peace back to the region. Tasked with the enormous responsibility of prosecuting those who committed serious crimes under international law in the former Yugoslavia since 1991, the ICTY, uh, was a groundbreaking entity. Its inception marked the first time since the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals after World War II that individuals were held accountable by an international court for committing large-scale atrocities. This was a historical moment. For the first time, the international community, not just the victors of a war, joined hands to form a court. The aim was to prevent further crimes, bring criminals to justice, and work towards establishing and maintaining global peace and security. The creation of the ICTY sparked a trend towards holding individuals accountable for breaking international law, especially during armed conflicts. The work of the ICTY tested the belief that enforcing international law can lead to the restoration of peace and security on an international level. Now, allow me to introduce our panelists. We're honored today to have two distinguished guests who played pivotal roles in, the shaping, in shaping the legacy of the ICTY, Judge Linda Monane and Arthur Traldi. I'm excited for you to gather insights and perspectives. Judge Linda Monane is currently an Associate Justice on the High Court of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. She has had a long and distinguished career from serving as a Colonel in the, Air, in the US Air Force to the Chief of the Court Management Services Section at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. However, one reason we are so excited to have her uh, joining us is because of her years of experience working at the ICTY. Judge Monane held many roles during this time, including the Chief of Court Management and Support Services and Senior Legal Officer assigned to the trial chambers. In these positions, she was responsible for the preparation of orders, decisions, judgments, and support in cases like Milotinovic et al. and Karadic, among others. Along with these positions, she also spent time as the acting head of chambers for the tribunal and the acting deputy registrar for the tribunal. We are so lucky to have you here today. Um, also joining us is Arthur Traldi. Arthur is currently an adjunct professor of law at Villanova University School of Law and a senior fellow for the Technology, Law and Security Program at Washington College of Law. From 2010 to 2017, 
He served as a prosecutor at the ICTY, litigating cases involving charges of genocide, crimes against humanity, and violations of IHL. Along with several other cases, Arthur led the component of the led the core component of the Ratko Mladic prosecution related to mass ethnic cleansing in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and secured convictions for mass murder, persecution, and other crimes. Prior to this position, he served as an associate legal officer in the chambers at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Arthur also works as a consultant and has done capacity building work with professionals responsible for complex criminal cases in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, and has advised on investigations into atrocity crimes. So thank you so much, Arthur. Um, and if it's all right with you, I was hoping I could present you with our first question to open up the discussion. Okay, that wonderful. <laughs> So the, um, the ICTY operated for 24 years. And I think some of our viewers, perhaps thinking along the, the, old, the lines of that old adage, justice delayed is justice denied, may wonder why it took so long for the tribunal to prosecute some of these officials. Um, can you explain why that was and, and if there have been any benefits to, to having this longer time frame? Thanks, Natalie, and thanks so much for having me. It's an honor to be here with the Red Cross today and, and to speak with Judge Murnane and with all of you. So I'm going to say three things about that to start. First, that I think it's not uncommon that legal processes take a while. Last Thursday, the Supreme Court decided a case about the mental element of the False Claims Act. The events in that case began in 2006, so 17 years ago. Uh, in these cases, of course, we're dealing with enormously complex fact patterns, enormously large quantities of evidence, and a huge number of criminal allegations under the same charge. So it's particularly unsurprising, I think, that the trial component of a case would take a while. The second thing to say is that in the end, ICTY had unprecedented success bringing to justice powerful people who had the resources to hide or avoid arrest for some of the time after uh, they've been the subjects of arrest warrants. Rutko Mladic, who you mentioned, for instance, was under indictment but not arrested yet for more than 15 years, spent most of those in hiding. Uh, Radovan Karadic lived as a faith healer in Belgrade for a decade. While they were eventually arrested, with defendants with fewer resources, it would likely have happened more quickly. And third, I think that there were unquestionably both costs and benefits to the passage of time. Important witnesses passed away in the almost 17 years between Mladic's indictment and when the trial began. While the tribunal's rules allowed for the admission of their evidence, it wasn't the same and didn't have quite the same weight as if they'd been there in person. And waiting for justice is particularly hard for survivors. But I don't think there's any question that the prosecutors, defense attorneys, and judges, on the last few trials particularly, were trying cases in a uniquely mature, professional international criminal institution because of the passage of time and the number of cases that had been done. My quick math says ICTY has done more than half of the total number of atrocity crime cases in the current modern era of international criminal justice. So more than ICTR, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the International Criminal Court, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, and the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia combined. And what that meant completing dozens of cases against other accused persons, is there were accepted procedural rules that attorneys and judges from different backgrounds generally understood, and that both prosecutors and defense attorneys had gotten much more familiar with the facts of what had happened. Those of us who stood up in court on the late cases had access to a massive trope of documentary evidence, mostly that other people had collected, and the ability to really properly and professionally do our jobs. And I, I think for cases of this magnitude, that's a really important advantage. Wonderful. Thank you so much for opening up the discussion, Arthur, and just reminding us how important this tribunal has been um, despite that longer time frame and maybe in part due to that longer time frame. Um, Judge Monane, if I could turn to you next, one of the core cases that you worked on was the Milotinovich et al. trial. 
where six um, high-ranking officials, including the president of Serbia, were charged with war crimes and crimes against humanity in, in Kosovo. Can you talk a bit about the, that concept um, that was so integral to the case of a joint criminal enterprise um, or command authority and the challenges that you faced um, or that were faced during this trial? So Arthur and I both uh, smiled and laughed a bit when uh, your question was, could you speak a bit about the concept of joint criminal enterprise? We could spend a year talking about joint criminal enterprise and we have only an hour. Um, and some of the people who have joined us today may be totally unfamiliar with uh, this concept of joint criminal enterprise. So I'll try to give kind of a high level and short overview of the complexity of joint criminal enterprise. Foundationally, it's important to recognize that um, all of the offenses that have been tried through international humanitarian law uh, find their roots primarily in the Geneva Conventions. And if you look in the Geneva Conventions for joint criminal enterprise, uh, do your search, do your GBT chat, do your a Google Scholar search, um, you're very unlikely to find joint criminal enterprise anywhere in the text of the uh, Geneva Conventions. Uh, and of course, my background that uh, led me to take over as the senior legal officer in the Milutinovic case after um, Milosevic passed away uh, was my 30 years on active duty with the United States Air Force, where I worked every day with issues related to the Geneva Conventions, which gave me a pretty solid sounding. So I also didn't know anything um, directly related to joint criminal enterprise uh, from that experience. But joint criminal enterprise is in essence best um, aligned, I think, with what would be US domestic legislation that outlines inchoate offenses. And for those who may not be familiar with inchoate offenses, inchoate offenses can generally be described as an, a type of crime that is committed by taking a punishable step toward the, the commission of another crime. And generally it includes things like attempts, solicitation, and conspiracy. So at its core, joint criminal enterprise for me as a US law graduate and someone who practiced criminal law in the United States for 13 years and as a judge for 10 years before I went to the tribunal, uh, I, I drew my best analogies from the law of conspiracy uh, as JCE has developed or joint criminal enterprise has developed in the international humanitarian law arena, particularly through the cases at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Um, there were, the challenges were many with respect to establishing that joint criminal enterprise and other types of indirect co-perpetration um, could be charged in reliance upon the foundational work of the Geneva Conventions. Um, but it's very rare that the president of a country who directs that his or her national forces take certain actions to accomplish a designated national objective actually goes to the battlefield. That's very rare. But I think what international humanitarian law and the ICTY in particular in its decisions has made clear is that when that national direction is set by the president of a country, by his cabinet, by those individuals, who direct where their military forces will go and how those military forces will transact their business, those high level officials can be held accountable under this concept of joint criminal enterprise. Uh, one of the very early decisions that um, was issued in 2006 that impacted the, um, uh, the decisions in uh, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia actually found that Co-perpetration was not a recognizable offense under the um, under the uh, Geneva Conventions. It was actually the decision on Oydnich's uh, motion challenging jurisdiction for indirect co-perpetration. That decision was issued on 22 March of 2006 uh, by Trial Chamber Three, um, and yet 
even though that particular decision said that indirect co-perpetration couldn't, uh, that trial chamber decision found it couldn't be the basis for Voidnich's involvement in, uh, in the criminal offense, eventually much of what actually was decided in the Milutinovich et al. case, later known as Shinovich et al., since Milutinovich himself was acquitted, um, is, is that it was a joint criminal enterprise. And um, so joint criminal enterprise involves holding accountable those who are directing the actions of those who are subordinate to them for carrying out a specified national objective and a determination by the finder of fact that those actions taken by those senior officials represented the planning, the organization or the, or the uh, necessary steps to require that others carry out an offense that violates the Geneva Conventions. I hope that's, Arthur, you may want to add anything you, you want to add to that, but that's my short, less than a year explanation of joint criminal enterprise. We'll go with that for now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Arthur, please feel free to jump in. Um, I, that was not an easy task, but I, I think you did a, a brilliant uh, job of, of explaining JCE and I think relating it to those inchoate crimes, um, it just makes complete sense to me. Um, while we're, we're on this topic, and if it's all right, I'd, I'd like to stay with you. Um, I was hoping you, you might be able to discuss um, if there were any notable moments or turning points during the trial um, that had that significant impact on the final judgment um, and, and maybe, you know, potentially what the legacy has been um, and how, how is this going, how are we going to see this impact um, leadership level perpetrators at the ICC uh, in cases of leadership level perpetrators? So, so another, another big uh, question, but I, I have faith in you. You're, you're handling them all very well. Well, thank you for that. I have to say um, that I remember with great clarity the moment that for me, the pieces fell into place, uh, listening to the evidence in the Milutinovich trial, that there was clearly a joint criminal enterprise. Um, and the pieces of evidence that actually made this so clear was this. So for those who aren't familiar with the background of the Milutinovich at all case, um, it 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 was uh, crimes related to the attempt to ethnically cleanse Kosovo uh, and to drive out residents uh, in Kosovo uh, for the benefit of the Serbs. Um, that's a shorthand version of a seven thousand page judgment. Um, and so, uh, one of the key elements of any military action is that there has to be a military target uh, or a military purpose for the use of force. Um, and in trying to assess what the military purpose might be for the shelling that occurred in Kosovo, occurring almost exclusively at night when people were trying to sleep, and get rest and when they were in their homes, um, there was very little evidence to show any legitimate military objective of the shelling that was occurring at night. There was also testimony in the Milutinovich case from victims of those uh, crimes that um, individual soldiers would come during the daytime, knock on the door and say that they had been told that this would be their house after they were driven out and these were the appliances and things in the house that they would like them to leave when they moved in. Um, so it became clear that it was uh, intended and designed for the homes to be taken over by uh, designated individuals uh, forwarding the or advancing the uh, national objective of cleansing the um, population um, and replacing them with Serbian uh, nationals. But what really brought it home as a conspiracy was evidence that in advance of a night bombing mission, series of night bombing missions, the leaders, the Serbian leaders who were perpetrating these offenses 
ordered that there be additional trains and buses added to the schedule so that people could flee. There's nothing that makes it clearer in my mind in the entire judgment, and there were thousands and thousands of pages of testimony, that this was a concentrated effort to cleanse the population rather than any legitimate military purpose than to see that they planned in advance to evacuate voluntarily by people fleeing their homes by bus and train, by adding additional buses and trains so that people could get out after they had been bombed all night and couldn't rest and couldn't sleep. Um, for me, that is a uh, was a, a key moment. And I remember very clearly discussing what possible military purpose that would have had since it was not a um, humanitarian evacuation. It was not being orchestrated by the military to put people out of harm's way. It was just schedules being added because they knew that the intended result would be people voluntarily fleeing their home. Um, and that to me was key and essential elements. In terms of the long-term impact on uh, other on the development of international humanitarian law, I think there can be no question that the combined work of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, as well as the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, and those um, special tribunals and, and uh, ad hoc tribunals that um, stood up thereafter, made, made clear that it is more than the framework of the Geneva Convention and that the development in practical terms of modern day warfare has to be the overlay through or the lens through which perpetration of these types of offenses is seen in the future. And I think the ICTY through um, the, the best of its judgments gave us that framework through which the Geneva Convention can be brought into the 21st century and applied in modern day warfare. Um, absent new agreements coming out through um, the efforts of organizations like the International Criminal, uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross. Yeah, I I think this is such a timely topic, um, and I think I think we're probably all just listening intently and and wait wanting to hear more. Um, I imagine we'll we'll see a lot of that ICTY um, legacy um, moving forward. But uh, just in the, the interest of time, Arthur, I'm, I'm gonna come back to you. I'm gonna move back to you. Um, you worked for the, the prosecution during the Ratko Mladic uh, trial. Mladic, also known as the, the butcher of Bosnia, evaded capture which uh, for 16 years, which you mentioned previously. Given the extent of his crimes, can, can you talk a bit about that, the impact that his conviction had and, and some of the challenges faced during the trial. Arthur, First, I think, I you're think Perfect. I caught it myself, but yes, thank you. Yeah, Zoom no, reminded good. me. <laughs> uh, uh, so first, I, look, I think the fact is that out of 160 people indicted, all very important cases by any conventional standard, there are a small number of cases that will be most important to the tribunal's legacy. Milosevic, Mladic, Karadic, because of their importance to particular issues, maybe also cases like Kunaritz or Kerstic or Perlich or the Celebici cases uh, or Milutinovic. But the fact that Mladic was eventually brought to justice after an enormous wait and a very long search is probably the most important part, given the centrality of that case and those charges to the tribunal's legacy. In terms of challenges during the trial, I, I think I'd convey both the legal and factual complexity, first, and what we were dealing with as prosecutors, but also the defense attorneys, judges, and their staffs equally. So Judge, Judge Murnane outlined uh, joint criminal enterprise a little bit before, and we were prosecuting four joint criminal enterprises in the same trial. These were not, by the way, in co-ate crimes. These were completed crimes. The joint criminal enterprise to commit genocide at Srebrenica, as happened. Um, 
each of which involved at a minimum hundreds, mostly thousands and thousands of, of victims. At the beginning of the public summary of the judgment, the presiding judge uh, described the evidence that had come before the chamber. He said Mladic involved about 600 witnesses, almost 10,000 admitted exhibits, that the judges had taken judicial notice of about 2,000 facts proven in other ICTY trials. And he said this somewhere around transcript page 45,907 of the Mladic case proceedings, which just gives a sense of the scale of what you're dealing with. So in terms of challenges, it takes a very long time to, do, to try a case like that. And one of the consequences of that is that you feel rushed every time you stand up in court. It's really important to get to, through things as efficiently as possible. Second, uh, that keeping track of all of it is a big job and it's really important to have a great team working on it as we did. And, and third, maybe most fundamentally, is the huge responsibility that comes along with trying a case of that magnitude that I think everybody involved with it on all sides felt every day when they when they went to work and particularly when we stood up in court and, and we're doing work that went directly into the record. Thank you. Um, if I could uh, just stay with you for a moment. Um, Arthur, I was hoping maybe you could talk about just given your experience uh, on the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda as well. Um, how do you think the ICTY set the stage for the ICTR, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, um, and, and other ad hoc courts that, that we've seen since? And maybe if you could talk about, you know, if you see us continuing with tribunals, if you see them continuing. Sure. So look, I think the biggest lesson of ICTY and the biggest legacy of the tribunal is that you can do cases of this magnitude, this complexity, this level of seriousness, professionally, successfully, effectively. ICTR started very shortly after ICTY. So I, I think of their work as developing mostly in parallel historically. But I think it's fair to say that if ICTY hadn't been effective, ICC, the Sierra Leone Court, the Khmer Rouge Court, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, the Kosovo Specialist Chambers, would have been very hard to convince people to take a chance on them. And seeing a model that, while people, uh, I think, would have loved cases to go more quickly, while everybody had little tweaks, perhaps, to the results, having one that did successful cases in this kind of system was really important. I think we will continue to see some types of ad hoc mechanisms because of the limitations that international law places on the jurisdiction of any single court. So for instance, even in Ukraine, where the International Criminal Court is able to assert jurisdiction because of Ukrainian acceptance, where it wouldn't necessarily be otherwise because neither Ukraine nor Russia are a state party, you see uh, states, including the United States, advocating for the creation of a special tribunal to deal with crimes like aggression uh, that fall outside of the ICC's jurisdiction, outside of any jurisdiction, that it could exercise even on the basis of the concept that it's received at this point. Wonderful, yeah, thank you. Um, I think we're all gonna be eagerly watching the news to see how, how the Ukraine situation develops. And, and if along the line, we will see, uh, we will see a tribunal for that. Um, the next few questions that I, that I have for, for you are really for both of you to answer, but Judge Monane, Perhaps I can I can start with you. Um, another area that I think will be of interest to our audience are the landmark cases uh, or decisions on sexual and gender-based violence, uh, including the trials of, of Kunarach uh, and the Celebici detention camp. Um, how do you think the, the ICTY has altered accountability for sexual violence during conflict? Thank you for that. This is an area that I've spoken quite a lot about. Um, and it's very interesting to see the limited um, guidance, I'll say, um, as to what constitutes the nature of offenses that are directly related to gender-based violence. When we were drafting the Milutinovich at all judgment, we searched diligently for existing standards to address things like uh, what constitutes consent 
And one of the real challenges in the international humanitarian law area is to avoid the imposition of any particular any particular cultural or religious view as to um, that act of sexuality that results very often in gender-based violence um, because of the question of what constitutes consent. When you consider that in the world, there are places where arranged marriage is still a permissible custom and tradition and respected by those nations. And you consider that in those nations in which custom and tra tradition permits arranged marriage, how do you define the issue of consent? Now, what was made clear in Militinovich was, I believe, the first place where we actually set out what would constitute the elements of the crime of rape um, in, in addressing crimes that occurred inside the camp, um, the Amorska camp. Um, and we looked at places like the Convention to End Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, where there's no definition. And we looked at a number of other places where there's no definition. And frankly, if one looks at the composition of the bench and the Milutinovich at all case, you might understand, if you look closely at the credentials of the judges who were on that bench, you might understand how the nature of those discussions unfolded. Um, and I encourage you all to take a close look at who served on that bench and what their custom and traditional background might have been, because it was different. Each of the judges came from a different culture and a different tradition. And so there were very high level philosophical discussions about whether or not this, these kinds of acts that occurred involving in particular women who were in the camps um, constitute a genocide not just constituted gender-based violence, but genocide, because by intentionally perpetrating an act of rape uh, or sexual assault on a woman who was from a particular religious practice, they would, uh, if it, if it came, became known that that had occurred, they would uh, not be um, invited to procreate within their own community ever again. Um, I hope I put that delicately enough and clearly enough that everyone understood it. So, and I apologize if it was too uh, carefully worded. Um, but in any event, um, I think that what it did do was get very high level uh, acad academicians, uh, politicians, uh, individuals in the judiciary and in the um, and in the prosecution and defense sides to have those very important discussions that avoid or attempts to avoid um, laying a Western or Euro European framework over the definitional concepts that are involved in gender-based violence. That's very important for us to keep in mind as we develop the international humanitarian law. Um, I've done an awfully lot of work in this area, um, trying to make sure that we are respectful of one another and of the cultures and traditions that each of us bring. And when, when you put this in a domestic context, we have definitions under US law as to what constitutes rape and what constitutes consent. And we have um, instructions that we give to a jury as to what constitutes rape, what constitutes consent. Um, but when you put it in the context of other cultures where an individual can exchange some jewels, cash and a cow in exchange for which a person is committed to uh, participate in a marriage that is arranged by her family or by his family. Um, and then you ask yourself what constitutes consent in that marital relationship. You have to scratch your head and wonder how we come to a common definition. Um, and so I think these are all very important concepts that will develop over time um, in an international humanitarian law con concept to bring to common understanding some of what we found as true when we found that there had been gender-based violence. Because it's pretty clear that when you hold a woman in captivity away from her family, 
and it is not an arranged marriage, and there is clearly no consent because that individual is being held by their perpetrators, or where a military member carrying a gun insists upon sexual favors being granted, that there really is global acceptance that that constitutes a rape. Um, so I think we did some. I think there's much still to be done. I think we did a lot more than what was in existence at the time that the cases were brought. And for each of those individuals who suffered at the hands of their captors, of their jailers, and of the perpetrators of crimes against them, I hope it brought them some comfort to see some decision made publicly that they were the victims of crime. Yeah, thank you so much for sort of highlighting that that cultural challenge uh, in coming to this consensus, these decisions. Um, Arthur, did you want to add anything on that? Maybe just to zoom out in terms of the legacy of those cases mm -hmm. from the details for a second. I, I think one of the big accomplishments in this area of ICTY and ICTR, to be fair, both of which devoted a, a great deal of attention to uh, SGBV crimes, was to put them in terms of the priorities of international investigators after conflict where they belong, which is hordes are at the top of the list, comparable only to unlawful killings. And that's not something that's clearly reflected in previous uh, international jurisprudence, not clearly reflected in previous atrocity crime jurisprudence. And so seeing that uh, work done at ICTY and ICTR, I think, was really beneficial for practitioners throughout the field. And you do see legacy of that, including at, I at ICC, uh, where it's focused heavily on, on allegations of uh, sexual and gender-based violence in the cases that it's done. And such allegations have been important to investigations of crimes against Yazidis in Iraq, against Rohingya in Myanmar, uh, in a way that I think owes a lot to the work that ICTY and ICTR did uh, in Militinovic and Mladic and other, in Kunaritz particularly and in other cases uh, in demonstrating that these can, should, must be an important part of post-conflict justice. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's a it's a really important topic under international law and and one that we are continuing to see evolve and develop. Um, so these tribunals are so key to that. Um, I did want to ask a question that comes from our audience. Um, how and this is to either one of you. Please feel free to jump in, but. How might you reflect and, and characterize the contributions of Judge Theodore Moran to decisions that will move into the future of the ICTY's impact on the future of IHL? Either one of you can, can jump in. I'll defer to our chamber's staffer on that. Oh, uh, my name, sorry, you're muted. <laughs> you missed my laugh. Um, I can understand why uh, Arthur wants to defer to, to me. I, I think it's really important to understand what the role of uh, the longtime president of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia uh, and the presiding judge of the appellate chamber for both the ICTY and the ICTR was. Um, and I think that uh, any individualized credit or lack of credit uh, attributed to Judge Maron alone would be misplaced. Um, it, it, it is important and something that I hope law students in the United States all appreciate um, and perhaps globally uh, law students appreciate, I don't know, um, because I don't have experience from all jurisdictions, but the decision of an appellate chamber is not the decision of one judge. The decision of an appellate chamber 
is the collective analysis of the record before them established by the trial chamber and by the litigants in that trial chamber. And no one judge's comments or criticisms or challenges or analyses um, directs the, the final outcome. It's, it's the combined effort of all of the judges who sit on that appeals chamber. Um, and that's true. And uh, as most of you know, the ICTY and the ICTR shared an appeals chamber and uh, President Moran during his many years as president of the ICTY and president of the appellate chamber sat on both the ICTY and the ICTR appellate cases. So to say that, um, to characterize the contributions of Judge Maron, first, I think it was important that the United States have a credible individual on the international tribunals. And because of his academic background and because of his scholarly writings, he brought that credibility that was necessary. How critically important do I think it was that the United States have someone on that court? I think it was extraordinarily important that the United States be behind the work of the ICTY and the ICTR. And that has been um, a resounding concern among my friends and colleagues who are at the ICC that the United States remains in the outer fringes of that work. And so if you ask me to begin my characterization of Judge Maron, the fact that he was there at all with the support of the United States government is an enormous contribution. Now, if you want to get into whether or not you individually agreed with some of the decisions that he was a member of a panel in deciding, and whether you believe some of the um, articles that have been written that criticize him as having politicized in one way or another um, the conversation and the outcomes, um, I can tell you that there is a reason why all deliberations that occur in chambers are confidential. And there is a reason why judges like Judge Maron do not step forward to defend themselves and respect with extraordinary concern the confidentiality of those deliberations. And therefore, having watched the process in action, having been part of the process in action, being a judge myself for more than a decade, um, I would say um, one might benefit dramatically from uh, keeping in mind that judges generally respect the privacy of the deliberations, guard it jealously to ensure that there can be a fair outcome and that anyone who suggests that any one judge makes the decision uh, might go back and rethink how those decisions come about. I don't know if that's that answers the individual's question, but I think the fact that he was there at all, that he was a very well-respected scholar um, and the work that he did as president of the tribunal, which has a great diplomatic, a great deal of diplomatic importance um, was actually quite uh, remarkable. And so that's what I would say with respect to the, the question that was asked. Having deferred first to my chamber's colleague, I think I'm going to add three things. The first is that for somebody in a for somebody in that role, for the longtime president of an institution, the first way I reflect on and characterize their contributions to the institution is during their period in leadership, was the institution successful? And I'd say yes. So that, that's something that he gets credit for in a way that not all of us do because he played a unique role. Um, second, in terms of the, the some of the allegations that the judge is uh, obliquely referencing here, I haven't seen any credible evidence of anything other than fair outcomes and fair processes. And, uh, you know, and I think I'll leave it at those two. Thank you, both of you, um, being able to answer these these difficult questions, tricky questions. Um, I 
I'm mindful of time and I do have a, a few other questions, um, but I want to just first, I think, I think we have time for one more question, but I also want to leave some time at the end um, for any general comments that you may have on the ICTY, its legacy and, and its impact um, on international law and, and specifically on IHL. But um, I think uh, one last question to, to both of you. Um, in prosecuting war criminals and, and working with victims um, and investigating sometimes these decades old events, can you speak to some of those personal or professional challenges that you faced during your time with the ICTY? Um, again, you know, either one of you can start us off. Uh, yeah. uh, judge my name, perhaps. <laughs> perhaps we'll start with you again. Well, I will say that the most electrifying moment in my eight years that I was at the ICTY um, was the day that Rako, or that uh, Radovan Karadzic came into custody. Um, when the buzz came through the building that he was, he had been captured. Um, even now, when I just say it, uh, I get goosebumps on my arms. I mean, it was like such an amazing uh, moment. Um, the work of Carla Del Ponte, the uh, po political um, weight that she brought to bear with respect to any of the uh, former Yugoslavia, the Baltic country, the countries of the former Yugoslavia becoming members of the European Union, um, the way in which eventually um, Radovan Karadzic came to uh, be in our custody was quite remarkable. Uh, during my um, four and a half months as the acting deputy registrar, I had occasion to sit in a private room with both Mr. Mladic and with Mr. Karadzic um, and had responsibilities uh, consistent with the detention of individuals charged with war crimes under the Geneva Conventions to ensure that their needs were being met uh, while they were in a detainee status. And um, the idea of being in a room with myself, uh, Radovan Karadzic, or myself, Ratko Mladic, one guard and an interpreter, uh, was really quite, um, quite a moment in, in my personal history. I will tell you, though, that one of the things that um, impacts me even to this day. And I think um, Arthur can probably speak to this more effectively than I can. I was a chamber staff member. I never had to go to the field other than for a field visit. There were staff members who went to the field. There were staff members present at mass grave uh, exhumations um, and work that was done and the impact on them. I did go to Rwanda following the genocide. I was on the first U.S. military assistance team that went to Rwanda following the genocide while I was still on active duty. Um, from a personal perspective, um, seeing the impact firsthand of the perpetration of crimes against humanity uh, is something that will stay with you forever. And finding the right tools with which to process that experience and to put it in a um, in a context that allows you to get up every day and still function as a human being can actually be quite difficult for some people, for many people. And uh, that's one of the reasons why they had mental health experts on the staff to assist staff who were dealing with that every day. But for me, and Arthur, I don't know that you even remember this case, but at the ICTY, one of the most compelling and tragic cases that I actually worked on uh, was Lukic versus Lu Lukic and Lukic, I'm sorry, uh, prosecutor versus Lukic and Lukic, and the Pianishka Street testimony of every survivor of the Pianishka Street uh, massacre stays with me every single day. I was the senior legal officer doing the pretrial and uh, supporting Lukic and Lukic. Um, and 
Um, for those who aren't familiar with it, on 14 June of 1992, a group of 70 Bosniak civilians, mainly from the village of uh, Koritnik, uh, were locked in mass in a house on Pianishka Street in Visegrad. Uh, some of the women were taken out and raped before being returned to the house. A grenade was then thrown inside, killing some. The house was then set ablaze. And while people were trying to crawl out of the house, through broken windows, they were shot. A total of 59 people were killed. A handful survived, and every one of the survivors of the Pianishka Street Massacre came and testified at the tribunal. Uh, that lives with me every day, every single day. I think that resonates a lot with with many of the audience members who are who are in who may be uh, working in the field as well so thank you for, for sharing that with us um arthur if i could then turn to you i i think i have very similar feelings um i think having visited uh mass grave during exhumation is a, a unique kind of experience that you live with for the rest of your life um I think I, I've been myself quite lucky. Uh, I had great teammates, great support systems at the key times, and we uh, and drew strength from the really incredible people that we had come testify for us, uh, who who had the courage to talk back to talk about what they'd gone through in public under cross examination, uh, and that that takes a lot. Um, I, I think the way I kind of bottom line it is that the biggest challenge was doing work that was good enough to live up to those people. And the kind of flip side of that coin is inevitably giving yourself to a calling, a job, a profession that is that much bigger than you are entails sacrifice. Uh, and it, do, it does for everybody and it sticks with you. Thank you for that. Um, and yes, we, we did receive a, a question in the chat, um, just wondering why this event is particularly relevant today. And, and to that, um, Judge Monet did, did answer it. It, it, is, it has recently been the 30th anniversary of the creation of the ICTY. And um, what we're doing is we're examining its, its legacy and it has uh, had such a profound legacy on international law, um, as well as these specific cases that we're discussing have had profound impacts on on everyone that that has worked in the field everyone that has been a part of of these international criminal trials um with that i i want to let uh let us finish with these last few minutes just to to get your perspective on on the icty its general legacy and um anything else you'd like to share uh, at the end and We'll go back to you, Judge Monet, and if that's, that's all right. Well, I want to thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this panel, and it's wonderful to see Arthur again. Um, it's been a long time since I've actually seen him, although we've been in touch to one, with one another various times over the uh, length of time. Um, I think that the um, my experience going to Rwanda following the genocide was so compelling. Um, I went to five of the genocide sites which had been visited by the United Nations and had been, quote, cleaned up, end quote. But I have photos that I took while I was there of the images of human skulls on a table as far as you could see and of bones and you know, the le leftover remains of individuals, even though the site had been cleansed. I went to visit um, unidentified remains of individuals whose, whose lives were lost in Rwanda uh, during um, the genocide there. Um, and when I came home from that experience, and I was still on active duty in the Air Force, I was on the phone with my husband, and I was absolutely sobbing. And I said, I feel compelled to come back and do something to help these people, to help these people. And at that time, I had been introduced to the folks who were working in the Gachacha. 
uh, some of the other work that was being done. And my husband, uh, who has truly been my my big, biggest supporter, um, said, I'll go with you anywhere and I'll do anything. And that's what's led us now to be in the Republic of the Marshall Islands, where we're trying to do what we can in the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Um, so we did what we could in Rwanda. We did what we could in the, in the former Yugoslavia. I did what I could with the Lebanon Tribunal. Uh, if you are, if, if those who are watching today feel called to do this work, understand what you're getting into, listen to what Arthur said about the feeling of whether or not you are doing enough to be the, the spokesperson for that individual and know how heavily that weighs on you every day as it did on Arthur and the teams that were presenting the evidence in those cases. And if you're going to do it, jump in, but jump all the way in. And that would be my closing remark. That, that's a beautiful place to finish. I feel bad saying anything. Um, Judge, it's been a real pleasure and a, a real honor to share a webinar with you. And, and thanks again to the Red Cross for having us. I, I think ICTY is a unique institution. Uh, it's a unique modern institution in terms of the, the scale of the casework it was able to do. Uh, certainly, it's been a unique experience uh, in both our lives and in the lives of many of my colleagues and a unique honor to be able to be part of. And so I, I'm just deeply grateful to be able to talk a little bit about it and, and have you be interested and, um, and, and hope this has been helpful and educational for some of you. Thank you so much, Arthur. Thank you so much, Judge Monane. It, this has been wonderful. I'm so sad uh, to say that we're at the end of our hour. I'd, I'd much rather stay on with both of you and just bombard you with questions. Um, but I know you're you're both very busy. Um, so we'll wrap up here. So a, a huge thank you again to, to both of our panelists. And um, thank you to our audience for coming and I wish you all a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you.